So looking back now from the all the pieces of data you've integrated, you've personally added, what do, what do you think it could be? I don't know. I don't know what it could be. I think we've been able to categorize it successfully into a few buckets. We've been able to say that, you know, this could be US technology that someone put in the wrong piece of sky or, you know, perhaps was developed and tested in an inappropriate spot by someone that uh, wasn't obeying best practices. Is but, there, uh, sorry to interrupt, is there a sort of uh, modularity to the way the, the military operates the way it's possible for one branch not to know about the tests of another? Yeah, it, I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that that could occur, right? And so if we just make that assumption, we can integrate that into our analysis here and just say, okay, but at the point we're at now, you know, we have to assume that that's not the case, right? With everything that's been going on and the statements have been made and the hearings, I think that if it was a, a, a non-communication issue, um, we're in big trouble at this point. What about it being an object from uh, another nation, from China, from Russia? Or even one of our allies, perhaps, right? Maybe allies. that's, an, you know, I don't think it's um, controversial to say that our adult allies could be gathering information about us or anything of that nature, but that would be an extreme case. But I think it's just important to say, right, to not just say Russia or China and just call them the bad guys and assume that if they don't have it, no one can do it. Um, and so from my perspective, you know, anyone else, anyone else, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a foreign power, it could be a non-government entity perhaps, although I think that's very unlikely. But again, these are these are things you must consider if it, you kind of throw everything, everything other than the US under, under scrutiny. But, you know, from what has been reported and the behaviors that have been seen, it would be, I would expect to see remnants of that technology elsewhere in the economy. There seems to be too many things that require advanced technology that would be beneficial commercially as well as in other military applications for it to be completely locked away by one of our competitors. Now, I could see us perhaps locking something away if we're already in the lead and having it to pull out as needed. But for someone that's perhaps in a power struggle and they're in second place, they might be more aggressive with the development of different types of technology willing to accept bigger risks. Do you think it could be natural phenomena that we don't yet understand? I think that there are a number of things that this is going to be, right? I don't think there's one thing at the end of the day, but I certainly think that that is part of what some of this could be. I don't think it's what we were seeing on the East Coast, uh, and I don't think it is related to the Roosevelt incident, or I'll even go out and say the Nimitz incident, but... What's the Roosevelt incident? The Roosevelt incident, typically referred to as the gimbal and or the go fast video. And then the Nimitz is from uh, what the David Fravor has uh, witnessed directly and has spoken about. So we'll talk about that as well. I'd just love to get your um, your sort of um, interpretation of those incidents. But yeah, so in this particular case, natural phenomena could be a part of the picture, but you're saying not the whole picture. Yes, yes, and we can't discount it. Oh, the other thing is, what about the failure of pilot eyesight? Like sort of some deep mixture of actual direct vision, human vision system failure and like psychology. Mm -hmm. Like um, seeing something weird and then filling in the gaps mm -hmm. because you, in order to make sense of the weird. I've tried to expose myself to scenarios like that, that I don't necessarily think are right, but I've explored them to see if they could have some truth. Yeah. And one example is, let's imagine a scenario where if we're seeing these objects every day off the East Coast, I can imagine a technology or an operation where you had some type of traditional propulsion system operating drones in order to gather data like we had discussed. And I could I could envision a clever enough adversary that could perhaps destroy or somehow remove these objects and replace them with new objects essentially when we're not looking, right? And that accounts for the large uh, airborne time. And so I, I explore options like that and I try to see, you know, what what evidence and assumptions need to be made in order to prove or disprove that. And, you know, you would need so much infrastructure, you know, you need so, you need so many assets. And so I try to explore some of those fallacies and some of those concerns. And as aviators, we're trained into many, uh, like actual physical, like eyesight and kind of illusion uh, trainings. So, 
like at nighttime flying, there's so many things that can happen flying with false horizons. And so we receive hours of, of training on that type of, of stuff, but this just falls outside the category from my perspective. What was the visibility conditions when in the times when people were able to see it? And then are we, <laughs> we just earlier discussed complete nighttime darkness. Mm. Um, in this case, was, was it during the day? It was a perfectly clear day that that, that particular incident, yep. In a world that's full of mystery, I have to ask, what do you think is the possibility that it's not of this earth origin? Mm -hmm. I like the term non-human intelligence in a sense. Because again, there's so much, there's a lot of assumptions in there that may cause us to go down the wrong roads. It could, you know, these could be something that are weather phenomena of earth, right? Or something else that is just, something we don't understand and can't imagine right now that's still of this earth. Um, if we consider extraterrestrials or something that came from a, a physical place far away in space time, um, you know, that leads us to some detection assumptions that we would need to make. And so I just try to not categorize it under anything and just say, hey, is this demonstrating intelligence? And start from there as a single object. What can we learn about it kinematically? How it's performing? What does that mean for its energy source? What does that mean for the G-forces inside? Uh, and then step it out a level and say, okay, how are these interacting with our fighters? If they are, how are they interacting with the weather and their environment? How are they interacting with each other? So can we look at these and how they're interacting perhaps as a swarm, uh, especially off the East Coast where this is happening all the time with multiple objects, right? And so we might be able to determine some things about their maybe, you know, sensor capabilities or the areas of focus, you know, if we can determine uh, how they're working in conjunction with each other. But, you know, seeing one little flash of an object uh, doesn't provide that type of insight. Um, but we have the systems for it, but, and, and it's kind of, maybe not an irony, but it's it's a fact of life, the reality that many of these well-deployed, highly capable systems are held under the military umbrella, which makes it difficult to provide that data for scientific analysis. So there's probably a lot more data on these objects that's not being, that's not made available probably even within the military for analysis. I think so, yeah. I think there's a lot of data that could be made available. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've been engaged with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics to build, you know, a large resources of cross-domain expertise so that if or when that data is available or that there's additional analysis needed, you know, we can spin up those teams and make that analysis.